Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the privilege of singing praise to you, to glorify you and to praise you. We thank you for your presence with us this morning. We pray that you would speak into our hearts, give us wisdom to understand. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint me with your spirit to be able to preach your word. This is an important word for all of us, and I pray that you would guide me through the power of your Holy Spirit to preach this word, Lord. So bless us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to speak about something which, as I said to the Lord now, is an important word. And that's name the will of God. It's a very difficult topic, but uh, to discern and know what is the will of God. And I want to try and share some things with you this morning that I pray will guide you and help you and bless you. And I want us to look at this idea of name the will of God. Now the first thing we need to understand when we talk about the will of God, it's good to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 says these things. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. So we have, we have three things here. We have God's secret will, we have God's revealed will, and then we have to talk about testing that will of God which we don't understand, we need, we need some discernment. So when we look at God's secret will, God's secret will are those things that we have no answer for. There are many things in this world and in this life that you won't even find it in the Scripture. The answers aren't in Scripture. We just don't understand it. We can speculate and, and so on, but we just don't understand it. It's an absolute mystery. When is he coming back, for example? Um, you know, uh, when certain things happen, why did that happen and how did it happen? It's just, it's a mystery. And those are the things that it says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, which is the secret things that belong to God that will eventually be revealed, but we don't know it. Now in that case, we have to then walk by faith and we have to walk by trust in God because we just don't know. We have to just trust Him. He's the one who knows. But then there are the things, the will of God that's been revealed to us. God's will that has been revealed to us that we all know. Now that's quite, quite easy. I'm going to share a few things with you about that quickly. The, God, the things that God has revealed to us, which is His will, is, for example, the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol of anything and worship it. You shall not make wrong use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Lord's day and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false evidence. And you shall not covet the possession of others. Now those are the Ten Commandments, the law that we all know. And then we have to be, oh, just to be obedient. It's, it's as simple as that. That's God's law. You've got to be obedient to the law of God. Then there are many other teachings of Jesus that we know is His will. I want to share a few with you now. There's quite a lot, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but just to give you an idea. For example, in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So, you, so, so you must love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now let me know. God's command is, His will is that we love one another. That we know that clear. Then we have, in scriptures we have, we see quite clearly that God's will is that we repent. There's a lot of scriptures, but I'm not going to give you all the scriptures, you won't remember it anyway. But just so you can just get into your spirit. We, God's will is that we repent every day. God's will is that we rejoice. Let your light shine. He wants, that's His will, that our light shines. Be righteous. In other words, be, walk in the power of God. And be the righteousness of God. That's God's will. Be reconciled to one another. Be reconciled to God. That's God's will. Settle matter of matters quickly. If you have a problem with a brother and sister, settle those matters quickly. That's God's will. Um, don't lust. Keep your word. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. 
Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Be perfect. Practice secret disciplines. In other words, your prayer time, your quiet time, all those things. Pray. Forgive. Those are God's commandments. Fast. Store up treasures in heaven. Don't worry. That's a very difficult thing. But God said, don't worry. Because if you worry, that means you're not trusting Him. Don't worry. Seek His kingdom first. Don't judge. Don't cast pearls before swine. In other words, the, the things of God. Don't put the things of God between, in front of those people that are going to just trample it in the mud. Ask, seek, and knock. We need to ask, we need to seek, we need to knock. That's what Jesus commanded. Um, live the golden rule. Don't do to others what you don't want to happen to you. <laughs> Enter through the narrow gate. Watch out for false teachers. Pray for workers. Be shrewd. Be afraid about the right things. In other words, be afraid of the, of the judgment of God upon you. So do the right things so that you are not judged. Hear God's voice. Take Jesus' yoke upon you. Honor your parents. Don't despise children. Go to offenders and make peace. Honor marriage. Be a servant. Be a house of prayer. Ask in faith. Render to Caesar what he Caesar's and render to God what is God. I remember when I was, there was a church in Athlone and we used to play cricket against them and the church warden, his surname was Caesar. And when he used to take the conviction, he said, remember what Jesus said, render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, what to God belongs to God. Give to me out the church warden. Give him a hand. Love God. Love your neighbor. Be ready. Take, eat, and drink communion. Make disciples. We commanded to do that. Baptize. Teach what Jesus taught. Deny yourself. Don't be greedy. Be born again. I was born from above by the power of God's Spirit. Keep Jesus' commandments. So those things are those are things that have been revealed to us. If you go through the scriptures, we know what the commandments of, the, of God is to us. And so we've got God's secret will that we don't understand. It's hidden from us. We just have to move our faith and say, Lord, I'm just trusting you. Then there's God's revealed world, which I've just read to you now, where we have to say, Lord, I'm going to try my best to obey, be obedient and to follow your world that's been revealed to me. Now that's not always easy. So the, the one is by faith, the other one is by obedience. But now I want to spend some time on the last one. And that is to discern God's will, to test God's will. Testing the will of God, where we don't, where it is not hidden, it is not hidden, nor has it been revealed. Now how do we, then we have to test God's will. How do we know what's God's will in a case like that? So, the first thing is that, it's not clearly defined in scripture. For example, I'll give you an example. If, if you feel in your spirit that God has called you into the ministry, for example, you have to discern that. You have to test it. You have to get others to help you test that. It's not in black and white. You just don't know. You have to. It's a very difficult thing, believe me. When I went to the ministry, it took me two years to figure it out. It's not that simple. Or if God sends you into the, into the mission fields and He feels you, you feel you want to go, it's not an easy decision. It's not just there for you. You have to test God's will. Or when God doesn't answer prayers in the way that we want, you pray and you pray, you don't understand. So you've got to test God and you've got to discern it. What is God saying to you? You need wisdom to discern His will. Okay, so those are the things. So I want to look at seven areas. Seven areas how you can test the will of God in your life. And I pray that you'll be blessed by it. The first way is through experience. There's nothing more valuable than a mature Christian or a Christian that has experienced things in life. Romans 12, which we read today, speaks about the renewing of the mind. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So you need to renew your mind, and the way that happens is through maturity. As through walking in the strength and the power of God every day of your life until your mind has been renewed. 
So then you operate out of experience of things that you know. And you test God in that through that experience. Um, because you've, you've seen it before. You've seen how, it operate, how God operates. You've experienced in your life. And so you say, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm testing this is your will. I believe this is your will because I've experienced it before. That's the way you do it. The second way to discern God's will is when there is a need. When there is a need, what has God brought to your attention? I remember uh, Rick Warren was speaking about his wife one day. She had a breast cancer. And she was sitting in the, in the waiting room for the, for the surgeon. And she was looking at this magazine. And in the magazine, it was dealing with all the children in Africa and other parts of the world who were suffering from AIDS. She immediately had a tremendous burden in her spirit for these children. And so she was convicted out of a need. And so she knew in her spirit, out of the need in her heart, that there was, it was God's will for her to be involved in the AIDS ministry. And they raised millions of dollars for the AIDS ministry. She got very involved in it. So that came out of a need that she felt in her spirit, that that was God's will. Acts chapter 16, verse 9 to 10. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, including concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So Paul had this vision of someone calling them. And out of that vision, out of that need, he concluded that that was the will of God. So the need prompted him to be in the will of God. And, and he discerned that was the will of God for him. Now, the thing is, you can't meet every need or every thought. Um, but you will, you will know in your spirit, out of that need that you feel, that this is where God is drawing you to. And then you know it's God's will for you. I, is, is there, can I meet this need? Lord, are you calling me to meet this need? And that way you test the will of God out of the need. The third way to test the will of God is... When there is an opportunity for you, an opportunity arises that you never expected. Why did this happen? Where do, you, where do you see the opportunity that God has presented to you in terms of knowing His will for your life? In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 5 to 9, it says, Paul said, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you. For I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened for me, but there are many who oppose me. So there's a door that Paul feels God has opened for him. So he's going to test that. God has opened the door for me, so I'm going to go there. I'm going to stay in Ephesus. The door is open. There's an opportunity for me to do the things of the Lord, and I'm testing it. And that's what we're going to do as well. And there's going to be some flexibility in that. How is God leading me in this particular thing? Lord, is this your will? I'm testing you. Is this where you want me to be? And then the interesting thing about this is that he also realizes that there are going to be many who are going to oppose him. So when God, when an opportunity arises, and God opens a door for you, and you discern through testing that that is God's will for you, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And just because it's not easy, just because it's difficult, and you're going to find difficulties on the way, that doesn't mean that isn't God's will for you. In fact, the devil is just trying to stop you. And that's what Paul experienced. So when opportunities arise, God will open a door, and you have to discern in your spirit, is this the will of God for me? Okay. Then the fourth thing is circumstances. There are circumstances that happen in one's life where we can discern that it is the will of God. In Paul's second record, letter to Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, chapter 12, to, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13, Paul writes to the church in Corinth and he says, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened the door for me, 
He found that the Lord had opened a door for him, gave him an opportunity, opened a door for me. I still had no peace of mind. So Paul said, I still wasn't, even though God opened the door, but he was testing the will of God, but he had no peace of mind. Because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said, goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. So he never had peace of mind. His brother in the Lord Titus wasn't there. He didn't feel comfortable. So circumstances changed the situation. And in his discernment of the will of God, the circumstances put a burden or, or put something in his spirit that made him change his mind. Now that can happen to you and me as well. It's happened to me many times. When you feel you're on a path, you, the circumstances, things open, you're going to go that path, you feel it's the will of God, and then something suddenly happens, and then you have to make other decisions. Um, and so we see that the Lord opens the door for Paul, but he had no peace of mind, because he did not find his brother Titus there. And so he leaves Macedonia. Uh, he went on to Macedonia. He left, uh, he left that place and went on to Macedonia. So the very thing that he wanted to do was change because the circumstances wasn't right. Then another important thing he tested in the will of God, and I think we all should all know this, or we should, maybe we should do this. When you're trying to discern the will of God for your life, when it is not, uh, when it's not something that's completely hidden, when it's uh, not something that's been revealed, you've not seen it in Scripture, but you have to make a decision. And you feel you have to make a decision. You want to do something, but you're not sure it's of the Lord. You've got to discern God's will in, in a particular situation. What you do then is, you have to seek counsel. It is wise to speak to someone who is a mature Christian and get guidance from them. Or speak to more than one person. Like for example, when you go with the Anglican Church, when you feel called into the ministry, you can't just, it's not like one guy went to the bishop and said, Bishop, listen, I feel God has called me into the ministry. I don't have to go to college. I don't have to study. In fact, you can just sign me up right now and give me my license. I'm ready to go. And the bishop in all his wisdom says, okay, well, I'll tell you what, you go back and ask God to put it in writing. <laughs> so, so you see, when there is no clear understanding of what God is calling you to do, you have to test that calling. So, for example, if you get in the ministry, for example, I have to go for two years of testing. You go, you go on a two year with, with uh, people who test your calling. Um, you do some simple studies just to see where you are, questions are asked. And then finally, at the end of the two years, you go in front of a panel of a whole lot of people, including the psychologists. And you get asked all kinds of questions to see where you are. Will you be able to cope and do and fulfill the calling that God has called you into? And I think some of the weakness in the, in the church today is that because they don't have any people been feeling called into the ministry, they just ordaining people left, right and center. It, you know, if somebody works in the church and they, oh, you're fantastic, they just, they don't put them through the process. And part of that difficulty is that they are not always successful and they struggle. Because they haven't properly tested their calling. So it's, it's, and that's just in the ministry, but it can be in a lot of other areas. When you feel called into a particular area of ministry, where you get, if you're called to do something and it's going to cost you something, it's quite a bit involved, and you're not sure, because if you're trying to test God's will, it is good to speak to a brother and sister who is maturing the Lord. We can give you some guidance. We can say to you, but have you looked at this? Have you prayed about this? Have you thought of this? Um, you know, and, and, and the counsel and the wisdom of somebody that is uh, not necessarily older than you in years, but in maturity can give you some guidance. So the counsel of brothers and sisters is a very important thing when you're trying to discern the will of God. I, many times people have come to me and said, God is, I felt God is saying this to me. Or I felt God is calling me to do this or that. But I'm not sure. What do you think? Then what you do is you try and pray with them. And you ask them questions. And you try to discern where they are. Whether they are able to fulfill that calling. Can they sustain it? And so on and so forth. So 
You can test God's will. God uses these circumstances. Proverbs chapter 12 verse 15 says, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. So you may think it's right in your own eyes, but you don't listen to counsel, and then you fall. And that's what Proverbs says. That's in you King, King James Version, by the way. So that's the fifth thing. And then the, the sixth thing, when you try to discern the will of God in your life, is you have a desire for something. There's a deep desire. Now, I felt that I had this incredible desire to go into the ministry. Uh, I never thought I could be, I could do it, but I had this incredible desire. What are the inclinations of your heart? God puts things in your heart, and how do you respond to it? You feel it with every fiber of your being that God is calling you to do something. He's put the desire in your heart to do it, but you're not sure, so you've got to test it. And, but it comes, it starts in the desire of the heart. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 11 to 12, it says, Nehemiah said, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few men. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounds with me except the one that I was riding on. And remember, Nehemiah built the wall, eh? He, he, the, 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 the wall. And so, at the end of the day, there was this desire in his heart to do that, and it wasn't easy. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 16 to 17. I thank God who put into the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. The Paul says Titus also had the same concern for the people, uh, the same concern that Paul had. For Titus not only welcomed our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And so the desire is in our hearts. There's a tremendous desire to, uh, to want to do something. I remember other, last week Ansel stood up here and said he had this incredible desire to, to build a church, to have a church. And God put the desire in his heart. And so we are now in the building that we reaping the benefits of that desire, which was God's will. That's how it works. If he never had the desire in his heart, they would, the building wouldn't be, wouldn't be here for this purpose. So God puts a desire in our hearts to do certain things. All right. Then the seventh and last thing is gifts. God gives us gifts. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 4 to 7. Paul writes to Timothy, he says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded thou lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of your hands. For God does not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self discipline. Have you noticed something? You see, God gives us gifts. We, are, we have been given certain gifts. It's a gift from God. It's God's will that we exercise those gifts. <laughs> but the weird thing is, it's typical human beings. Paul is saying, the gifts that God gives us is like a coal in a fire. If the coal is taken out of the fire, the coal dies. So the body of Christ, the people of God, must be in the furnace, in the fellowship of believers. And they need to fan into fan into, into flame the gift of God. Because you see so often people are gifted and then they don't use their gift. They say, ah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to get involved. They are very gifted, but I'm not going to do it. And because they don't do it, the gift dies. It doesn't die completely, but it slowly dies like a coal that's been taken out of a fire. And so Paul is saying to Timothy, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying of our hands. The gift that God has trusted to you. Paul, fan into flame the gifts God's given you. In Romans 12, which is read today, we see a few gifts. In Romans 12, verse 5 to 8, in 5 to 8 says, So in Christ, we who are many, we form one body. Okay? And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. So we are all part of, the, of one body, but we all have different gifts. 
And Paul uses the analogy of the human body, you know. Um, the eye can't tell, the, 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 the hand can't do without the eye, the hand can't do without the foot and so on. You, you, you can't have your left foot gain left and your right foot gain right, you're going to have a major problem. You won't be able to walk. Imagine your left foot has a minor bit of and it goes that way and your right foot goes that way. So everything has to work together to make the body function. So he's saying that we all have these gifts to make the body of Christ function. If a person's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. Notice, you use it in proportion to your faith. You see, because when you're going to prophesy, it's uh, not easy to prophesy because you, you, you're testing. You're not 100% you're not sure that it's God's will, but you prophesy because you believe it's God's will. You experience it, you know it, you put it out there. And then God will confirm it. And then as he confirms it, your faith grows. And I know it's happened to me. You become more and more bold and you just trust God in it and so on. But if somebody's got that gift, they must exercise it. If it is serving, let him serve. If you've got the gift of serving, let that person serve. Serving is a gift. It's not something terrible. It's a wonderful gift. The church will not be able to function if it were for the people of God who serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. Some people have the gift of teaching. They're very good at teaching. Others aren't very good at teaching. But he says, let them teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. Thank God for the encouragers of the church. People who have the gift of encouragement, they just, they just got it in them. It doesn't matter what happens. They will come to you and they will encourage you. Others won't do it, but they have got that gift. They have this ability to come to you when you are feeling down and encourage you and lift you up. And they don't even know it, but they're lifting you up. So thank God for the encouragement, the Barnabases of the church, who have the gift of encouragement. If it is in contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. See, there are some people who are quite wealthy, who have got their financial resources, and were, which is a gift that God has released them in their giving. And so they contribute to the needs of others. And he says, let them then give generously, don't hold them back. Because they're exercising a gift that God has given them. And all of this, it is the will of God. If it is in leadership, if somebody, you see, leadership is another thing. Not everybody's born a leader. Some people are just natural leaders. God has given them the gift of leadership. Doesn't matter what happens, they just automatically take over and they just get things done and they get everybody organized and it happens. That's a gift that God has given certain people. Let him govern, and then if it's leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Who would have thought that mercy is a gift? Because you see, it's not always easy to have mercy. Most of us, we get angry, we get mull, and we don't have mercy for no one. Now, I hope you suffer, the wheel will turn, you'll get your day. You know? But yet, people have mercy, that it's a gift of God, doesn't matter what happens. They've got the capacity and the ability to have mercy on that person. And give them another opportunity to start again. So all these things, you see, all these things are important. God's secret will. When we don't know what God is saying, do it. Then we must have faith. We've got to trust Him, we've got to have faith in Him. And then we have God's faith revealed and are shared through the Ten Commandments and a whole list of other things that we know. That's God's will. And then we have to be obedient in what is revealed. And then the last thing we've been looking at now is this discerned will. Discerning the will of God through experience, through, 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 uh, through needs, through opportunities, through circumstances through wise counsel, through desires, and through using your gifts. And I believe if we operate in that way, we will know exactly what God's will is for us. And we wouldn't struggle, and we wouldn't battle. Because I've seen, and I've gone through that, just not understanding what is God's will for my life. And I think by putting all this stuff into practice, you will know God's will for your life, and you will be blessed. Amen. Amen. So let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you, Lord, that there are some things that we don't understand. There are some things that you have shown us that we have to obey you. 
and there's other things we have to test your will. We pray that you give us uh, courage, that you give us strength, that you give us ability just to trust you in the most difficult of, difficult of circumstances. Lead us in the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to trust you and to, to be in your will. It's a wonderful blessing to be in your will. We thank you, Lord, that uh, in you we can do all things. So we give you all the grace, all, all, all the praise, we give you all the glory. We thank you for loving us, we thank you for blessing us. We thank you, Lord, that you give us hope, that you give us strength to face every day of our lives. And so, Father, I just want to pray for my sisters and brothers here today and those who are watching on the video. I pray that you would guide us all, that we would be able to discern your will and know your will for our lives in everything that you've taught us and that you've shown us. We want to be in your will, Lord. We want to be guided by you. We are your church. We are your body, the body of Christ. So lead us, Father. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.